Good afternoon. I'm Pastor Brian Holman, and this is our Wednesday afternoon Bible study. Study. We have quite a few people that are absent and away from us this day, um, and we couldn't broadcast. So we are recording this study, and then of course uh, I'll be emailing and let you know uh, where you can find us online because I'll upload it. But we are looking at chapter nine. But before uh, in Gospel of Mark. But before we get there, um, we want to lift up some things in prayer. We know that uh, Eddie Betts is in St. Joseph's Hospital, and so we want to be lifting him up in our prayers. We want to be thinking of Michelle Payment as well, as she's still uh, still kicking at uh, <laughs> at France, St. Francis House. Um, so there's several other concerns that I don't feel that I can mention to you. Are there other concerns that you have that you'd like to lift up as we gather together? I probably do, but I can't think of much of time. <laughs> Being frustrated with the camera. Okay. So let's have some prayer. Gracious, loving God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love that you show to us and for the trials we face that puts our faith into practice and our trust in you. Lord, we just ask that as we meet together, you be with those who are not with us this day, who usually join us in person, that you might meet their needs and surround them with your love and let them know that we care for them as well. For the many needs that we pray regularly for within this congregation and the extended congregation, we also lift up our concerns and prayers. Lord, we just ask that you might open your word to us today, that we might gain a, an understanding of its truth, and that you give us then the strength, the conviction, to be able to put those truths to life in our lives. For you want us to be doers of your word, not just hearers of your word. So make us hearers now, and give us the conviction to be doers. For this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 And so I want to look at chapter 9. Uh, we finished chapter 8. And, um, and so it says, And he said to them, There was a crowd that he was meeting and with, and Jesus predicts his death. We studied last week about Jesus feeding, the second time that Jesus fed a large crowd. This was 4,000. Whereas the other time in the chapter 6 was 5,000. This is not a, a mistake in repetition. Um, it's the locations. And uh, the location for the first one was with the Jewish community. And the second time with the 4,000, it was with the Gentile community. And we also looked at various aspects of that and how important it is because uh, Jesus Christ revealed God's concern not just to his covenant people, the Jews, but also for all people. Some may think that that doesn't pertain to us today, except it does, because sometimes we in the church can look at ourselves as being the special uh, covenant people of God. But we have to always be reminded that God's not just interested in us, but is interested in those who are not actively worshiping and following Jesus Christ. And so we need to open our hearts, our minds, uh, and have empathy uh, for those who struggle in life and who desperately need to know the Savior. He also then, on both times, um, the second time, we think, well, how foolish are the disciples because they didn't remember the other time which Jesus miraculously fed the 5,000. Sometimes we need renewal of those things that we believe in no end. You know, we pray for spiritual renewal. The renewal comes when we recall what God has done in the past. And we forget and we remember the truths that God has revealed to us. And so the disciples were slow to learn. And we too are often slow to learn. He also then expressed that we are, or his disciples were, to responsible for feeding the crowd. And so that is also what we are responsible for too. We who are disciples of Jesus Christ are asked to be able to feed, and that means spiritual food, not just physical food, but also physical food, to, to provide what others need. 
beyond just those within our community. That's a challenge. It's a challenge enough just to love those within our community, let alone extend ourselves outwardly to strangers or neighbors and those who may be resistant. But there's also a lot of other things within chapter 8 of the Peter's Confession of Christ. When Jesus asked him, who do you say that I am? We each must come to that point of confessing what we know is true, who Jesus is. But then we also know, just as Peter uh, didn't like what Jesus said um, and didn't want Jesus to, um, to proclaim that, that his own death, uh, Jesus then uh, chastised Peter. At any point in time as a believer in Christ, we are either for Jesus or we're against Jesus. We may believe in Jesus and think we're for Jesus, but we oftentimes struggle with making sure that we accept what Jesus reveals as his will. So we can be either a, a cooperate with Jesus or we can be an instrument that obstructs the work of Jesus in this life. And that's a good reminder for us. He then, uh, in chapter 8, also looked at the crowds and um, uh, he told them about his life and about his pending death. And um, then he come, we come to chapter 9. And he said to them, I tell you the truth. Some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. And we have to stop there and think about that. What did you think he means by the kingdom of God? Going to heaven? His resurrection. His resurrection? Okay. A lot of people will look at the kingdom of God as being when Christ returns and establishes his rule here on earth. So we believe in the second coming. And so what we many people misunderstand and say, well, look at you can't trust the gospels because it says here Jesus himself, some who are standing here, standing there at that time will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. We know that Jesus spoke to his disciples and said, wait here in Jerusalem, the beginning of Acts, until I send you receive the Holy Spirit, and then you shall have power okay, to proclaim the gospel where you are at, near and far. Okay, I'm paraphrasing. So the power is the coming of the Holy Spirit. So the kingdom of God is already here. Okay? Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is near you. Okay? But what he's referring to is not Jesus' second coming, but he was referring that there are some who are there with him, hearing him, following him, who would not die before they experienced and saw the power of the Holy Spirit the kingdom come from on high to dwell with us. I hope that answers some questions that many people might struggle with as they come to some of those passages and they scratch their heads and think, well, wait a second. It's been over 2,000 years. Those people are long since dead and gone. So Jesus might, must have not known himself or, you know, is not trustworthy. We just misunderstand what Jesus <laughs> is trying to convey. His kingdom is here. The Holy Spirit is here. And we can experience the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven now. We may not experience it in its fullness because we only experience that in our resurrection. But yet, his kingdom is here. And we can experience the power in our prayer life. His power as we conform to the Spirit and follow the Spirit, and all of a sudden our lives are made whole, healthy, um, and we live, and empowered to live, in his example and in his teaching. Any questions before I go on? There, that's the first verse, and here I had to discuss something, I had to clarify something for you. Any questions? Okay, very good. Then he comes to a next section, which is the Transfiguration, and we all have heard of the Transfiguration, it's preached every year, and re read every year, which it should, 
It's in um, the other Gospels as well. It's in Luke and also Matthew. It's not in the Gospel of John, though. Okay. Um, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, three of the twelve, an inner circle of the inner circle. You know, he had a circle of twelve disciples that he chose, and there were more disciples or followers that followed well behind him when he traveled, but he chose twelve out of them to be his apostles or disciples. Doesn't mean that the others were not disciples, but it means something different. He chose these to for a special purpose to represent him. And then from those he chose yet only three to go with him out to see a little bit closer about who he is. That's important for us to realize is that we have a limit to the relationships that we form. Uh, they tell us in our network of relationships. We cannot relate to 100 people closely and intimately. We have a smaller number uh, of people that we relate to on different levels. So he is also showing us that we need to find two or three. You know, what did Jesus say? Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am also. So it doesn't take a large crowd to have Jesus in our midst. But we'll experience Jesus more fully when we are, can identify two or three brothers or sisters, when we draw really close to and share openly with our faith and experience things together. So he chose Peter, James, and John. Why he chose them, I do not know. With him to, and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. So the four of them were alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became da dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. Kind of looks back to the experience of Moses when he went up on the mount. And he all of a sudden was transfigured as he came back down. He all of a sudden got a lot of gray hair. <laughs> and he, he, there's a different countenance about him because he experienced a deeper intimacy with God than normally people would be able to experience. So experiencing God personally changes us. Think about that. Do, do people recognize the change in us? That's important. There's a statement going around in a group, I know that uh, in Syracuse, that uh, says, be the change. We are to be the change. So we need to ask ourselves, are we intimately connected to Jesus so that the change that our relationship with Jesus brings to our lives, is it evident to others? Do we kind of go, I don't mean your clothes are going to be bright and shiny, you know, and use a lot of bleach. Doesn't mean your hair is going to be gray, though, you know, some of us have hair and some of us have gray hair. It means that there's something different about us. What are some of the differences? that you see in people that you know um, have experienced an intimate and close relationship or encounter with God through Jesus Christ? I think a calmness. A calmness. Comes over a lot of people. Okay. A sense of peace. Yeah. I know even in little things like if I'm really upset about something and everything, if I just sit down and have a chat, you know, and he brings it kindness to Maybe that reminds me of a, of a gospel song, Have a Little Chat with Jesus. Oh. And I, have you heard that one before? I haven't heard that. Oh, well, it might be that Jeff Hunt will sing that for us uh, this Sunday, because I know that's one of the songs I remember. It's an old gospel song. Um, have a little chat with Jesus by and by. Anyway. Um, okay, so there's a sense of calm and a peace. Peace comes from realizing that while there's a lot of things that we can be anxious about, um, Jesus is in charge, in control. And so by releasing, relief, releasing our trust to Jesus, we can take care of business, things we can handle, and we can leave to Jesus to take care of things that we just can't handle. And we can also rely upon Jesus to help us handle those things that we can. So that's very good. So there's a, a sense of trust. Uh, I would say a sense of confidence or assurance, uh, a calmness, 
uh, are not given to reaction or, or panic, uh, that type of thing. So thank you, Sharon. What other um, how what other transformations happen in people who are really close to God through Jesus Christ? Think of people that you know that you say, "Wow, I, they got something special." They witness. They witness, and it's not hard for them to witness, is it? It just seems to be natural and flows, um, and we admire them for that. Okay, their life is a witness, and the words that they if say. You keep, if you keep things positive to other people, even strangers, they'll listen. So that's another uh, aspect of a transformed personality <coughs> or transfigured personality is is that um, they what now? You vocalize but you but you stay positive. You don't you stay positive. Stay very so, positive about what you're speaking to You know that's hard for me. I, I appreciate that one Charlie because <laughs> I sometimes might find myself and I shared this in all of our one of our my, my teachings lately um, regarding the fruit of the spirit and I said that's one of the things I struggle with is uh, it says in the word do not grumble and complain. I tend not to grumble and complain before everyone, but uh, there are a few people that are close to me, like Peter, James, and John, that I might grumble and complain to. And I grumble and complain to God and uh, do so quietly, and uh, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit kind of touches me and says, why? You remember that passage? Do everything without grumbling and complaining? Oh, yeah, dang it. <laughs> you know, uh, so, so it reveals my weaknesses, yeah, but also reveals my desire. You have to get it out, the grumbling and complaining, but if you get it out in the wrong situation, it will turn off instead of it's talking right. to the other people that are listening. Very true. So there's, there's a, a sense that we convey positive. So everything might be negative around us, and we can get sucked into people's negativity, their conversation, all about culture and politics or whatever, but somehow we are to be able to look beyond the events to see that God is doing something and a confidence that God is doing something so it doesn't doesn't destroy us. Uh, I think that's important. What other type of changes do you think that uh, close relationship brings? I think of uh, thankfulness. A thankfulness. For what, what you had. I mean, uh, what has been provided for Okay. Um, and I think it also, you start noticing the little blessings in life that we might take for granted. Yes. You know, I mean, sometimes, you know, you go, oh, well, that was a great blessing or something. But, you know, we have a thousand little blessings every day that we just take for granted. Yes. You know, I, uh, we may, you know, we sit down and say grace at dinner and everything. Uh, but you got to think about that. How many people? can't sit down to dinner and yeah. he has how many people get up in the morning it can't eat they don't even have a cup of coffee you know um, and, and plus other things just being being thankful for our health so that's a quality you know that's part of that verbal witness all of a sudden people are drawn when you see someone who's positive and they can also verbalize their thanksgiving how we interact with the waitress Mm -hmm. uh, or anyone else that we might, a, a person at a checkout line. You know, we can either be miserable and we can pick up on someone else's miserableness, or we can truly be thankful. We can express that thankfulness without ever saying Jesus' name. And then we might, they, as people get to know us, they might realize that the reason for our thankfulness is, um, is because of our relationship with Jesus. And it might interest them in knowing how they can have one as well. So there's different things that we can go on. I, we've been studying, we, I concluded this last Sunday with uh, a teaching series on the fruit of the Spirit. And while there are nine fruit, I'm sure that we could actually add to those nine, okay? Matter of fact, when someone asked me for the notes, and I don't really, I, I might give myself some notes when I'm quoting stuff, but I just kind of prepare and then I it's called extemporaneous preaching, so I'm not reading all the time. And uh, so some, a couple people asked me for, can you give me your notes? Gosh. So I had to recreate them. And so I, I produced them and published them 
you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday in our in our devotion. But there were nine, and then I, went, I, I know I, I said there were nine, but then all of a sudden as I was I, I was going through them, I actually found a tenth. So there were ten <laughs> that I wrote. The ten commandments. Ten commandments. So the um, but I'm sure we could add even other qualities besides love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, kindness, faithfulness, um, you know, and self-control. We can add to those if we think about those. So I think that is what transfigures us. We possess those qualities, hopefully in increasing measure, not all at once, not uh, fully, um, but we work at those. That's how we want to be. So I think that's what it means by being transfigured. Well, we are transfigured. Jesus' transfiguration was something different. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. Now, just very quickly, why Elijah? He represented the prophets. And Moses represents the law. Two big figures of the Old Testament. And we have to realize that those are two big figures. There's three of them. Oh, isn't that interesting? Three. What does three represent? God. God. Um, Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. You know? It's nice to be able to see something that says, wow. You know? We oftentimes look for um, the wow factor. Even in worship, we can look for the wow factor. Um, and if we are looking for the wow factor, always, then what happens is we are taken away from where we might really see Jesus and the truth. I want you to think about that for a little bit. Um, let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Now, he did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Now, Peter was the one who was frightened. Um, there's several different types of ways of being frightened. One is being scared to death. Okay? Frightened is not understanding how to take what you are experiencing. That frightens us. That makes us insecure. How do I understand this? What am I supposed to do with this? Why, why did you lead us here to see that? Well, it's good that we're here because, oh, this is amazing. Okay? But in being amazing, you also want to keep uh, the experience. Okay? Oftentimes when we have a close encounter with Jesus, or a close encounter with God, we want to keep it. But you know, those encounters, those real close encounters, do not come and stay. We have to live, come down off the mountain, we have to live in the real, real world, and we have to take what we glean from that experience so that we are empowered in our daily living. There's going to be a time when we'll be in the presence of Jesus and nothing will separate us. But we live in a world in which we are separated from Jesus. And we just have to accept that. So, um, then a cloud appeared and enveloped them. And a voice came from the cloud. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. In the Old Testament, again, you have to understand the Old Testament to understand what's happened in the New Testament. God appeared to the people of Israel in a pillar of fire okay, at night and a cloud during the day and he guided them. Remember? So here uh, all of a sudden we know it's God because then appeared a cloud and enveloped them. It's kind of interesting because some, we, we've got to be able to have the perception to see God amidst the clouds that come our way. Uh, and then he heard, this is my son in whom I am all pleased. Listen to him. What's important is that he wanted to build three shelters, one for Elijah, one for Moses, one for Jesus. He was putting them on as a parody. I mean, they not uh, parody because of more two, but uh, he was keeping them as the same equality. Okay, but they're not equal. The prophets that we read about are important as instruments to bring the message of of God. 
the law is important to us. It helps to reveal the truth of how God, God expects of us. But more than that, uh, there is Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. So while we listen to the prophets and we listen to the law, we understand them through Jesus. Listen to Jesus. He is my son. He is the fullest expression of my will for you. Any questions? Which should, which, which should basically tell us that you have to work all three together, not set that independently. Correct. But even if I really want to understand, you know, the Old Testament has a lot of confusing, conflicting stuff. Why this? We understand and interpret the Old Testament, both the Law and the Prophets, uh, through the lens of Jesus. In his teaching, he, when he teaches about the law, the application of the law, his applications are more important than what we read of in the Old Testament. We can go, oy vey, how could they do that? Why would they allow that in the Old Testament? But we understand them through the lens of Jesus. Okay? Um, I have a go ahead. I should know this. Go ahead. Going back up to um, chapter 4, mm -hmm. then Elijah and Moses appeared and began talking with Jesus. Mm -hmm. How did they appear? Because he only, was only up there with the three disciples. Mm -hmm. there. Then all of a sudden Elijah and Moses appeared. So how did he appear or how did they appear? How, how, how did they appear? How did they join the group? <laughs> all of a sudden, I, I believe that this is, they just appeared. It kind of, um, um, it might have been a shadowy figurines. Or they might, you know, tangibly. Were they there physically, tangibly? Um, we don't know. Jesus was very tangible. Okay. But we have to understand that even though Elijah never died, okay, he was... He was translated into heaven, okay, in a whirlwind. Um, so, uh, and then Moses, we know he died on Mount Nebo. Um, so, what the? I think it was a physical uh, appearance, um, which can lead people to talk about. See, there are ghosts. You know, they can take us down a rabbit trail that is not really helpful for us. What God does, God does for a purpose. And so, um, you know, God spoke uh, to Balaam through Balaam's ass, uh, donkey, excuse me, um, <laughs> not through his, but, but his donkey. God can speak through a donkey, make a donkey speak. Doesn't mean that donkeys speak or are aware. But God can do that which we cannot begin to comprehend. And there's a certain mystery we must accept in following And were the God. three disciples removed from the trio? They weren't? Right with that group, where they, they well, they got to see them. They got to see them, but they were not. And they got to hear that they were speaking to one another. And it'd be interesting to know to have a, a be a fly on the wall and hearing what they were speaking about. Okay, uh, maybe they were asking Jesus um, about understanding why are we here? Um, what's the purpose? What 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 are you doing now? Um, because Jesus, being God in human flesh, would have that omniscience we call that understanding uh, whereas even the prophets and Moses would have limitations in understanding and that's a good important thing for us to realize because no matter how versed we become in the scriptures we will have limitations and we must accept those limitations and with humility let others know our limitations so kind of now that I reread this chapter 8 it says suddenly when they looked around Moses and Elijah were gone yep so just as quickly as they, they, came, they came in they, came. they left except for one Jesus Jesus because only Jesus was with them yes because Jesus is the most important we need Jesus that doesn't mean the Old Testament is not important the prophet and the law but we need Jesus because without Jesus we cannot understand fully what the Old Testament, really, God is speaking to us through it. 
Um, as they were suddenly, they looked around. There's no saw no one there except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So all of this remained secretive until after the resurrection. Okay, why? Why would he ask them not to mention it now? Why would Jesus tell them not tell them to not mention to it now to the others? I think he's getting. I think Jesus is getting direction from God as to what to be revealed and what not to be revealed on God's time. But it would take a lot of, re- of explanation of, yeah. for Jesus if he had to explain to all the other disciples what had happened. You know, there are some people who are given uh, special understanding. Um, certain teachers, certain, you know, and, and so we rely upon them. And we kind of wonder, how come this wasn't revealed to us? Some have been given a special revelation, a gift from God. And they communicate that to us. Because if God, if Jesus were to reveal this fully to all of them, there would be no reason to have faith. Okay? So what happens is that I have to listen. I had to listen to my father and my mother who had faith, my grandmother, other people in my life who had faith, Henry Medea. I had to listen to Helen Hirsch, Elizabeth Dunkel. I had to listen to a lot of people I could name who had special understanding. And I had to trust that God was speaking through them. So also, when someone's going to come rely upon you for understanding of what the Old Testament means, how does that fit in with the New Testament? How does that fit in with Jesus? They aren't going to have a special revelation. They're going to have to trust God, but they're going to have to trust God through you. Boy, that's a weighty responsibility. And they know, well, yeah, and and, and they right would know what you're able to communicate because even you aren't the expert either. You're yeah. still learning to learn do it in your communication to yep. what's being revealed to. Yeah, right. It, it's taking it out of just I'm going to get it anyways, and the point that I'm going to get it from the people around me. Have you ever heard someone say, "Well, if, if Jesus is real, God is real, why don't He just reveal it to everyone?" Because even if he did, our addiction to rebellion would still remain. And because even as James reminds us, even the you know Satan and the demons know, but they still reject the truth. And so it is a requirement of faith. Uh, Hebrews 11. Um, faith is the is a substance of things yet unseen. The assurance of things unseen. Yeah, uh, and so um, faith is what we need to exercise. Um, in our relationships, you know, I judge that someone loves me not just by what they say, by what they do. But from what they do, I still have to have faith that they will always express that love. And so faith is a necessary ingredient that which God recognizes that we need to have. We need to have faith. When I lifted yesterday, Ruthie wanted to get up in the tree. That first branch, because her sister did. You know, I helped her up and <laughs> wake her up and you know, Parker was too busy with the toad. Anyway, so I lifted her up, you know. She was scared. She said, Don't let go. She needed to have the faith that grandpa would not let go. To get her through the fear of the unknown. Fear of the unknown. We need to have faith. And so uh, we oftentimes come to believe through the witness of other people. How do I know? That's their experience. That's how, you know, so they had this experience on the mountain. How do we know? Well, they're going to have some confirmations through the resurrection and such. This will only deepen their faith and understanding. That would be a really good thing in wedding vows. Yes. Yes. She's a bride and groom, you know, and in counseling before, of course. Yeah. But um, 
because you know you stand up there and think you're gonna love each other forever. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's why it says better for worse for, yeah. sickness. And, <laughs> you know, but, uh, it's a tough thing. Yeah. Um, so as they so he told them not to say anything because until after he had risen from the dead because he wanted them to exercise faith, the other disciples, um, until uh, he gave them another piece of evidence. You see, there's always pieces of evidence. But you know, if we ex live by the evidence that we have today, okay, I haven't seen Jesus today. I haven't seen his hand working, okay? So we begin to doubt. We have what you call thankfulness for things that are present. We also um, have remem memory of things that where we saw Jesus, um, you know, up close and experience with Jesus. And we need to rely upon those because we can't have those experiences every single day. And just like the, with the bread and the, the breaking the bread and feeding the, uh, the 5,000 and the 4,000. It took more than one experience. But then Jesus gives one experience and then there's another experience. But ultimately we have to live by faith. Without faith, we cannot please God. That's what the Word says. Um, and so uh, they kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. What does he mean about rising from the dead? He still didn't have an, they didn't have an understanding that he was going to die and that he was going to rise from the dead. We're slow to understand. We kind of wonder, you know, how could they not get that? He mentioned it several different occasions. But, you know, we need reminders over and over and over again. Some will say, well, I've heard that story in the scriptures about the transfiguration before. Many times. Why do we need to hear it again? Why do I need to hear the Christmas story again? Why do I need to hear the crucifixion story again? We're slow to understand and appropriate the fullness of what it means to be forgiven and live in faith to walk uh, with Jesus. Writing from the dead would be a concept hard for them to really understand. Mm -hmm. In other words, you know, it's not something that is something common practice. And so when he's talking about rising from the dead, they probably didn't really understand, <coughs> but maybe mm -hmm. just didn't question him about it. No, they might have, they've experienced uh, the raising of uh, Lazarus. Lazarus, that was in John, uh, but also the, the um, synagogue rulers, the okay, daughter. Yeah. Um, but they could have thought in their mind, well, she wasn't really dead. Jesus is cool and he has power and he was able to resuscitate her or whatever. You know, we always try to explain away what we do not understand. Instead of receiving and believing by faith. All of a sudden they're facing a problem. Do I have faith? Well, he did this this time. I can identify in the past. How do I know he's going to be faithful this time? That's a requirement of us to exercise faith. And I, and the word is exercise faith. You know, we exercise faith. We practice faith. Even in the midst of our doubt, we exercise faith. But right? Jesus raised those other people from the dead. And who was going to raise Jesus from? Very good. That's a good question. So they didn't fully understand. And they asked him, why do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? So they get in a sense that Jesus is the Messiah. But you see, they were taught uh, that the Messiah was going to appear in a certain way. As a conquering hero, a warrior, to come and to take over the kingdom, okay? Restore the kingdom, like when it was under King David, to make the nation prominent again instead of an occupied territory. Um, they were taught that, and that Elijah, the scriptures in the Old Testament, say that Elijah was going to come first. Jesus would remind them in the Gospels that if you can accept it, John the Baptist is Elijah. Okay? But they had to accept that. See, it was going against the grain of what they were taught. With Elijah re reappearing in transfiguration, maybe that was the Elijah coming before the Messiah. 
Well, you know, this. so he wasn't coming uh, as the Messiah, the promised Messiah, the anointed one in the Old Testament, uh, in the way that they were expecting. Okay? Because they understood the Old Testament with how they wanted to understand it. And they taught their children that. And Jesus surprised them. It was because a break, he didn't come in yeah, the same way. A break from their routine, a, something different, change. Okay. So how many of us, all of a sudden, someone gets up and, and proclaims they were dramatically healed on a, a testimony time on Sunday morning? Well, our thoughts were, I don't believe that. What do you say? I'm just as good as they are. I have as much faith as they do. Why would Jesus do that for them and not for me? You could add all sorts of other questions, right? And and that distract us. And so um, we also begin to then say, like there's many who say, well, healing doesn't happen today. That was back in Jesus' time. Or in the apostles, in the early days of the early church. It doesn't happen now. So a lot of things that happened then, no, we don't have exorcism, deliverance of demons. That was in Jesus' day, right? And also the early apostles. So what we do is we then pass on our spiritual doubts. Instead of recognizing, hmm, um, while it may not be as often as what we might read of here, God can still do those marvelous things. 22 years ago, I was given seven hours to live. Here I am. Are you sure you're here? I must be. Oh, okay. <laughs> the same thing with a, yeah. probably my best girlfriend. We've known each other since we were three years old. Mm -hmm. She got diagnosed with a horrible cancer that they had to lift half her face up oh. to get it out. They did it and came back on the other side. And her doctor said, There's, I'm sorry, but you're not going to be able to survive this. She went down and got in her car and sat there. And she told me she felt a presence in the back seat of her car that was saying to her, you're going to be okay. And she's now 76 years old. Mm -hmm. So, you know, she said, I, Sharon, I felt a presence in that car with me like I can't explain. You know, there's so many people that that because of what they normally experience, they discount what God may do. God remains God. And there's always a reason why God will act in a certain way. We may not understand you know, why her and not someone else. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not what we're supposed to figure out. We're supposed to look at what it was God doing through that. Because rarely does God just do it for us. But God works something in our lives in order to benefit others too. And that's that requires exercising faith. See, they're exercising. We put faith to practice. It just doesn't come naturally. We have to exercise it. So he redefines what their expectations were in verse 12. To be sure, Elijah does come first. That's what the Old Testament talk, talks about. Yes, Elijah does come first and restores all things. You know, why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? Because it also says that in the Old Testament. Okay, so he's, he's saying, well, it does say this, but it also says this. See, we can pick and choose, okay, what we want to hear out of the scriptures. But we need to listen to the entirety of Scripture. And we have a hard time living in the gray area. Okay? And so he then says, um, I tell you, Elijah has come. And they have done to him everything they wished, just as it is written about him. Now, he didn't go ahead and say, Here, that was John the Baptist. In Matthew, he does. Um, but um, the, for the purpose of Mark, um, he, he didn't include that. Now we go then to something which is hard for us to believe in. Okay? Verse 14. When they came to the other disciples, they came back to the group, they saw a large crowd around them. 
Oh, not again. We're going to have to feed them again. <laughs> <laughs> not again. They sure like bread and fish, huh? They certainly do. I hope they had a lot of tartar sauce. <laughs> and the teachers of the law arguing with them. So in other words, his disciples, the other, um, the other nine were there and group approached them. Jesus wasn't with them. Neither were the other three. And they were arguing with him his other disciples. Don't you love it when someone wants to come up and argue with you about the matters of faith? Um, as soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. Ah, forget these guys. You know, they don't have the answers for us. Let's go to the source. All right? What are you arguing with them about, he asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought my son who is possessed by a spirit and has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. I've had experiences where I've been in a situation in which I felt that I was being looked upon to be able to have the answer, to pray and make everything all right. Have you ever had that type of experience? Whereas they looked at you as being a Christian and that you were going to make everything okay. And then if you goofed up, if you didn't say the right thing, if it didn't happen as you predicted, and so you were asked to pray for someone, and you pray for something and it didn't happen, they're going to look back on you and your prayer and, their, and your example, and they're going to say, see, Jesus is not real. I don't know about you, but I've had those moments. I had those thoughts in my mind. And it made me think about, hmm, what should I pray for? Do I pray for healing? Do I be bold enough to pray for healing? Do I, am I bold enough to, to pray for a restoration of a relationship? Am I bold enough? You know, you can, you can fill in the gaps. Okay? That's how these disciples were kind of feeling, I think. They were overwhelmed. Okay? Um... So whenever, and so he's, he talks about the situation that they could not do. I know why I cannot do. I am not Jesus. Okay. I'm not going to call for a healing service in which people come forward and I'm going to touch you on the head and all of a sudden, boom, you're going to fall over and know you're going to, all your problems are going to be gone away. I don't believe I have that power. Okay. Um, and so they said, um, Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. Sounds like an epileptic seizure, doesn't it? But they wouldn't know about epilepsy. Right. We know about epilepsy. So instead of saying all oh, those these dumb, you know, two thousand years ago Jews, you know, we have to read it in context. Does God use our illnesses like epilepsy and other things and other mental illnesses to destroy our life? Yes. Evil can use those. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Oh, unbelieving generation. Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the board to me. Isn't that kind of harsh of Jesus? And we're not you, Jesus. How many of us are willing to claim, I'm going to go out on the street and I'm going to be able to do the wonderful things that Jesus did? I could understand your frustration. Hopefully you can too. So why is he calling me unbelieving generation? So if I believed enough, I'm sh I should have the same power that Jesus has? I don't have his omniscience. I don't have his omnipotence or his power. You know, unless God is working through me and informs me, yes, I will do this. Okay? I don't have that. I am limited. I am an unbelieving generation. Okay? Um, what else would we, might we take that phrase, oh, unbelieving generations? Was he saying it to his disciples? Or was he saying it to the crowd? But you never thought about that question. Was he saying it to his disciples? Were they the unbelieving generation? Or was he saying it to the crowd that was gathered? 
probably to both because his disciples probably didn't have a really strong belief that they could do what Jesus could do. True. Or what could be done. I live in, even though I have faith, I live in the limitations of my faith. Um, and I accept that. Yeah, I think it could be both. And it's still that way today is that people that get unsure and they don't know what to believe in and what who to, what to turn to and what not to turn to. Well, the, the generation usually refers to everyone mm -hmm. in that age of that time. Mm -hmm. So it was the crowd also, yes, because they didn't have faith. Uh, that it could be done. And it may be also because they didn't believe it could be done could that be done. prevented the disciples from being from able to, their, to do it. Yeah, do Remember how he faith. said to the woman, by your faith it has been done to you? Okay? So it may not be his disciples. Yes, they had some limitations and, and frustration with being expected to do what Jesus could do, but it was also a lack of faith. Now we can have a lack of faith too. Do we as a small church, do we as Christians, um, do we have the power to change the world? In principle I say yes. But in reality? In practice I have my doubts. And that doubts limits how what I might do. And I'm ashamed of that. But I have to own it. I have a limitation. Uh, I do. I have faith in God. I have faith in Jesus. I do not have faith in me. I don't have faith in my faith. Is that what I mean? But you have. To, but if you can inspire a group, you might make a difference. If you can put your yeah, faith right. out and have other people believe what you believe, then you can. Well, make and that, a difference. right, and that goes back to what he said earlier about working with three people, and those three people will work with another three people. And, and they have uh, to believe. Right, they all have to believe. Yeah. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? Why does that matter? Why does that question matter? How long has he been like this? Is it something that happened from birth, or is it something that acquired later on? Yep, and so they said from childhood. Okay. It has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, notice the if you can do anything. Do they have faith in Jesus, who has already fed the multitude, who has already done these other things they heard about? If, if. Okay, if. you can do anything, take pity on us. And then Jesus says, if can. you can. <laughs> <laughs> oh, unbelieving generation, how slow you are to believe. Of course I can do this. I have to admit my own limitations of faith in believing what, what God may do. Both in my life and others. I will, I will sometimes wonder as my stage in my life and spending over 40 years in active ministry, I'm, I kind of wonder, well, what have I really accomplished for you, Jesus? Uh, no, my wife can bolster me up and some friends can bolster me up and some pull some things out of the past. But still there's that haunting thing that a feeling that, you know, what can I do? Have I wasted my time, my energy, my life? Everything is possible for him who believes. So in other words, sometimes because I doubt in the present what I've done in the past, if it meant, made any difference, it may prevent me, listen very carefully, it may prevent me from exercising bold faith in the present. Do you understand what I mean? I'm not just trying to refer it to me. I'm trying to refer it to you, back to you. S sometimes we look at our lives and we say, well, have I wasted my time? Can I really make a dis difference? I just follow along. I don't expect that God's going to do great things in me and through me. And if we do not expect that God can do great things in us and through us, will God do great things in us and through us? No. 
because we don't believe. If we believe, then we can be bold and say, you know, I'm going to contact my neighbors. I'm going to invite them. I'm going to do this. I think at the church we can do this. Uh, and, and we can draw other people to come to us. We can form a relationship and make a difference in other people's lives. Instead, we don't believe, so we just hunker down. I'm not accusing our church that way, but I think it's all churches. We can, we can hunker down and think, well, there's not much we can do. God's not going to work through us. And if we don't think that God's going to work through us, God's not going to work through us, right? That's a challenge, and it challenges me, you know? Um, everything is possible for him who believes. The trick is there, what is it that God wants us to do? What is it Jesus wants us to do? Are we willing to accept what Jesus wants us to do? Not what we expect that Jesus will do for us. Do you get my understanding? Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my, my unbelief. That's a, a phrase we need to underline and highlight. Because you and I are like this boy's father. We believe. Don't we? We believe. But we're also crippled by unbelief. I believe, but will God do it now? Will Jesus do it in this circumstance? And the limitations is what we believe that he can do. Ouch. So that's our prayer. I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit. You deaf and dumb spirit. He said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. See, oh, now there's something that uh, about spiritual deliverance, the evil spirit can leave, but it can also return. Remember the teaching about someone cleans out their house and the evil spirit goes, but comes back and finds that it is empty and goes, finds seven other evil spirits, and that person's state is worse than what. So many people have come to the altar, asked for forgiveness confessed sin, repented of that sin, and, and said, I'm going to live a life of following Jesus Christ. But that's it. And they don't. You see, we got to do something to fill the house. It's clean, it's empty, now i got to fill it up. I need good Christian friends to fellowship with, to study God's Word, to pray with. I have a mission that God wants to use my life for a particular purpose. I've got to be active in doing that. I've got to fill my empty house with the Word of God, with prayer, with the fruit of the Spirit. There's things I've got to do. And if I'm focusing on the good things that God wants to bring and do in my life, guess what? Evil has no place to come back in. But I've seen people fall off the wagon. And I'm not talking just about drinking. I'm talking about sexual. I'm talking about anger. I'm talking about all sorts of different things. We need to replace what is evil with what is good. And if we just come to the altar symbolically and get cleaned up, it does no good. It has to, we ha it has to change what we do. Okay. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out, and the boy looked so much like a corpse that many said he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. Oh, how, how often do you want to be taken by the hand? Lord, take me by my hand. You know, I'm fearing death. I'm fearing, you know, what the future may hold for me. Take me by the hand. Do you believe he'll take you by the hand? Mm -hmm. A lot of people at times have struggled with that. We may even have a time of struggle with that. Uh, after Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, Why couldn't we drive it out? 
why couldn't we do the great things that we hear that Apostle Paul and Peter and James and John and all those others do? Why can't we do those great things we read about? He replied, this kind can come out only by prayer. In other words, prayer means you cannot do it by yourself. When we do things on our own, it's going to be failed. Remember what Jesus said in John 15, Unless you abide in me, you can do nothing. So Jesus will show us the time, the place, where we can claim Jesus is going to do this to us. Okay? And we can only know that when we pray. But you know, what do you do when you pray? Do we just pray spitting out words? Or do we really believe, by faith, that God hears. That God cares. That God is going to do something with my concern. Do we really believe that? Or I'm just going through the motions. I have to leave that as a rhetorical question. We each have to answer that for ourselves. They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. So he wanted to have concerted time to teach his disciples. He wanted to be with the crowds, but he also wanted to be with his disciples. Do you know that Jesus wants to be with us? You know, we can go through the day and we can believe, but do we know that Jesus wants to be with us? with you. He, he said to them, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him and after three days he will rise. So he explained again, he's going to die and rise. And that's not their image of what they understood the, the Messiah was going to be. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. Are you afraid to ask Jesus about the questions you have of faith? Well, if I ask this question, I'm admitting to God that I have struggled with my belief. Well, that's the point of asking him. Okay? They did not understand. Well, I want to understand. Help me to understand, Lord. You know, what does James say? Many of you do not understand because you do not ask. And you do not ask because you have mixed motives. And if you are a, a duplicitous person, you believe what you don't believe, then don't expect that God is ever going to answer you. Read that. That's James chapter 1. You want help, you got to seek it. And you've got to believe truth it. When all of a sudden the truth, truth is before you, you've got to believe it Jesus. and act on it. And act on it, right? Very good. Um, so they did not understand. So, you know, they didn't understand because they were taught this is how faith is lived out. And Jesus was giving them something totally contrary to their experience. Okay. Who was the greatest? They came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? So they're always discussing with each other. Yeah, it's not the things they should discuss. But they kept quiet because on the way, they, they had argued about who was the greatest. Now, does that mean who is the greatest in their midst? Yes. Does it mean, okay, well, I'm a follower of Chuck Swindoll. I'm a follower of Joyce Myers. I am a follower of Billy Graham. I'm a follower of this. So, well, he's greater than Chuck Swindoll. Oh, no. Um, you, know, you can name all sorts of whatever names you want. We, we pick teams. Oh, SU. You know? SU. You know, it's it's... You know, that's the greatest, right? That's who I follow. Who is the greatest? Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, If anyone wants to be first, he must be the last and the servant of all. I want to use Simone. Is that her name? The gal, the gymnast that oh, yes. stepped down. Is this Simone? Yes, Simone. Yes. And, and it took a lot of courage for her to say, I've got some mental problems right now. And if I continue to compete where I'm and expect what I'm supposed to be able to do and I can't do it because I'm disoriented when I'm up in the air. I'm going to hurt my team. But she just didn't go and hide and seek counsel 
She was there to encourage her she teammates. Teared her That's a wonderful thing. A wonderful thing. Um, she was willing to be a servant. That still makes her the best gymnast, in my opinion. It's better than a gold medal. Yes. Yes. Uh, and the servant of all. He took a little child and had him stand among them, taking him in his arms. He said to them, now this is a little child. This is an infant, because he took him in his arms. If you can get the imagination there. Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me does not and does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. Okay, so either if you welcome one of these children, you welcome me, and if you welcome me, um, does, does not welcome me, uh, but the one who sent me. So think about, well, I have had conversations with some people who didn't believe in infant baptism. I believe in believer's baptism. I also believe in infant baptism. I'm not going to tell God what God's going to do. Hey, you know that little child, you know the parents, like with recent baptism we had, they didn't show up for service but came afterwards and probably was bad. Anyways, but uh, <laughs> we won't go there. Um, um, even though I wondered about the environment they're going to be raised in, I still believe that somehow because of we received and welcomed them, that hopefully God's going to touch and do something in their lives. I can only do, you can only do what we can do. Yep. We're limited. God is not. So we need to realize we need to welcome the littlest one. Now, the littlest one is the one who has the least amount of knowledge. Okay? The least amount of experience. So you may feel like you're diminished as a Christian because you're not used to having the Word. You haven't weren't read the Word when you were growing up. You didn't weren't exposed to those things of faith. And so you feel deficient compared to other Christians. You are welcome. And whoever welcomes the, the littlest one welcomes Jesus. Never shy away because you feel like you don't match up to other people's accomplishments spiritually. You're just as important. I hope you take that to heart. Um, Where is not against us is for us. Teacher, said John, we saw a man driving out demons in your name and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. Oh, we got to be a special group. <laughs> oh, because we're not the Wesleyan Church down the road. Oh, because we're not part of uh, Believer's Chapel. Oh, because we're not part of the vineyard. Oh, because we're not part of Abundant Life. Then God's not going to work in us. And so, you know, you got to be one of us. Isn't that human nature? Doesn't cut it. Doesn't cut it. Jesus says, don't stop him. No one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. <coughs> I tell you the truth. Anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you are belong to Christ now that has to be something that he was added. You know, Mark is already knowing who Jesus is, and so he calls him, instead of saying, uh, water in my name because you belong to me, he says, because you belong to Christ, will certainly not lose his reward. And one of the purposes of that is because they didn't necessarily know him, but they knew what they belonged to Christ. So we might not necessarily be, uh, I hope you get my drift up. If anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone tied around his neck. In other words, if by our attitude we discourage the faith of someone who has lesser knowledge and experience than we have, we then discourage them. And they might become discouraged that they just say, I can't do it. God doesn't love me like they love these pers persons over here. I can't be them. God won't use me. And those are all lies. Who is the father of lies? Come on, who is the father of lies? 
And we got to decide, discern between the lies and the truth. No matter who you are, God loves you and God can use you and God can work in you. And he's not going to work in you the same way he's going to work in some other person. Listen to that. He's not going to work in you in the same way he's going to work in some other person. So quit beating up on yourself. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. He doesn't mean cut off your, <laughs> your hand. It's hyperbole. It's exaggeration. Okay? Uh, it means that if there is an idea or thought that you are holding on to, get it out. Cut it out of you. Don't believe it. Chase it away. Okay? Um, it is better for you to enter life maimed than with, 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 then with two hands to go to hell. In other words, don't let anything tangible prevent you from experiencing the love of and believing the love that God has for you through Jesus Christ. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. Now, what does your hand do? It's the thing that acts, right? What does the feet do? It's the thing that walks. Okay? So in other words, you know, if you're walking in the wrong direction, Thank you. go a different direction. Turn around. If your hand's doing the things that are not right, do something different with the hands. That's right. What happens, what we do shapes how we feel. If all of a sudden someone is feeling unloved and they cannot, you know, can't find someone to really love them, another human being, so let's go to the strip joint. Let's look at pornography on, on, on the computer. You know, you're going the wrong direction. You're looking for love in all the wrong places. Okay? And love's right there. So many people are chasing after things that they think that will fill them, which will not fill them, but lead them to destruction. In Proverbs it says, I think it's Proverbs 4, there's a way that seems right unto a man that leads to destruction. It may seem right, but leads to destruction. And if your eyes cause you to sin, plug it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell. So, of course, he's not asking to pluck out your He's asking us to be able to take that which is an obstacle to our following fully and rip it out of our lives. Rip it out of our lives. I can't tell you what it is that might be in your life that's being an obstacle. You know what that is. Rip it out. Rip it out. Everyone will be salted with fire. What do you think that means? Everyone will be salted with fire? We salt something to make it taste good or to preserve something, right? How are we salted with fire? Being tested. Tested with fire. Meaning adversity. Struggle. We're all going to be tested with fire. Salt is good, and it says this in Matthew as well, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? If you've lost your perspective, if you've lost your belief that faith is going to make a difference, how do you make it come back? He asked it an open-ended question. How do you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with each other. Have salt in yourselves. So no one can make it happen but ourselves. Have salt in yourselves. No one can come and give Charlie faith. No one can come and give Paul faith. No one can come and give Cindy faith or Bonnie or Sharon or Pam or Peter or anyone. No one can bring it to you. We have to believe. We have to exercise faith. Any questions? I know that's a lot. So my challenge to you, the challenge for this chapter is, what are you going to do? A little one, you who feel insignificant, powerless, what are you going to do? Are you going to have faith? 
God can make a difference in your life today? Can you challenge the limits of what you think is possible? Because through Christ, you can do all things. That's the challenge. It's the challenge every day we live with. Let's pray. Gracious, loving God, we just thank you for your love and for the truth of your word. Oh, it's hard hitting. Can't you be easy on us for a while? No. Because if we take it easy, then we'll slip back to the same old patterns that are so natural to us. You keep wanting us to press on. Not for your sake, but for our sake keep at it. Help us to keep at it. Lord, we believe. Help our unbelief. Not our disbelief, but our unbelief. Places in our life where we do not practice what we say we believe. Help us, Lord. We ask this in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I apologize, I don't know why uh, the... Uh, Facebook wouldn't let us on and use the camera that we wanted to use. Um, I suppose I could have just gone ahead and used the camera on the computer. Um, but uh, we'll be posting it, so let other people that you know that may be wanting to watch it and have watched us, uh, that they will be able to find it online. Okay? Very good. And I'll send out the, the site of where you can find it. Okay? And I'll also post it to uh, Facebook. Have a good and godly day. And let me know, Sarah, if you need some help. Okay, will do. Will do.